bit dubious whether I've turned the recorder on properly or not. After my few experiences of pressing the button too long and going back off again in the past. So, sort of double check. It's great to be with you all this morning again. I should have had a copy of the notice sheet for this week's services. Um, evening service this evening, my dad's taking, and Bible study on Tuesday again at 7 30, my dad's taking. And obviously, coffee morning Wednesday morning, youth club Wednesday night. And it's not on here. I can't believe I checked this and I didn't check it and I got it wrong, but it's our monthly communion service on Thursday evening at 7.30. Please let me know if you're planning to come, or you want to come, so I can make sure obviously we've got the right tables in the right places with the bread and the wine ready on the table. But if you want to come, please let me know, so I know in advance. 7.30 Thursday. My mum's got to take no responsibility at all for not being on the news sheet this week, because it was me and Ben that were sorting it. So. She normally sits there and says, I always feel I've missed something off, so but you're completely innocent, see, so. Obviously, next Sunday morning service, Andrew's taking that and Anne and Tyler next Sunday evening. Obviously, still for our prayers, Just remember those in the church here, with health issues. Those of us too are worried about other people in our families with health issues and situations. Perhaps no one else perhaps understands, we feel we can't even talk to other people about. We can talk to a God that knows and hears and sees everything, can we? We're going to listen to our first hymn now, which is, O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider all your works, my hands have made. Well, I do think it's the other word version. But it's, O oh Lord my God, how great thou art.
Sweet pride. O oh Lord, Almighty God, our hearts cry out to you this morning how great you are. Lord, when we think of the wonders of your creation that we have just heard some about, your mighty power displayed throughout the universe in which we live, your authority, your power, your control, we have to acknowledge that you are Almighty God and that you truly are on the throne, that you are a faithful, unchanging, eternal God who keeps your promises, who cannot lie or fail or forget, but Lord, nothing compares to the wonder of your love. Your love in choosing us, of loving us while we were still lost sinners, of loving us before we were even born. So much that you gave your only son. That our Lord and Saviour, your perfect spotless son, suffered and died in our place in full to pay for our forgiveness and salvation. Our judgment, our, your eternal just wrath for our sin fell on him instead of us. Lord, and when we think that our Saviour, our sins bear it, we scarce can take it in. That on that cross our burden gladly, gladly bear it, he bled and died to take away our sins. To make us ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. To give us access into your presence as our Heavenly Father. To worship you as the Almighty Eternal God. Not out of fear, but out of love and adoration. Because of who you are and because of everything you've done. We thank you for the victory our Saviour won. No one took your life from him. He laid it down. He took it again victorious. That we can have an assurance. A guaranteed 100% assurance that the victory our Saviour won is ours and is ours forever and nothing can separate us from your love. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful glorious truth. We pray that this morning that you'll stir our hearts to praise and worship you as the great almighty God. To give you the praise and honour and glory. To be filled with adoration and gratitude and love for our wonderful Saviour, for all that's been done within our hearts and our lives. And Lord, for your Holy Spirit, draw us closer and nearer to yourself and speak from us from your word. Lord, please forgive and remove anything you see as wrong. Lord, we thank you for this privilege of being able to pray to you. And we pray, Lord, at this time, for those on our hearts and minds, members of our families, O oh Lord God, with health issues, fears and worries we have, O oh Lord God, about situations that are out of our control. But Lord, we pray most importantly, those members of our families which do not know you. Oh Lord God, open their hearts and open their eyes to see their need of you. We think, Lord, of our nation. We realise, oh Lord God, we have been so blessed in the past. And even today, even after the last 18 months, of all our countries gone through, we realise still, Lord God, when you look around our world, we have been so blessed and so privileged. And Lord, we are so ungrateful. So unworthy of your love and gratitude. So unworthy of your grace and your blessings. Lord God, please forgive us. Please have mercy on us. And Lord, I pray the voice of your people in your church will truly speak in this land of ours. And that through your Holy Spirit, Lord, you will use the witness of your people and speak to the hearts and the lives of many others. We pray today for every church, for every service being held, both live or online. And we pray, O oh Lord God, that you will pour your spirit and blessing and mercy upon our land at this time. Our leaders, Lord, give them wisdom and guidance to make right decisions. But most importantly, Lord, open their eyes to see their need of you. To realise reliance on man and science is not the answer, but to come and humbly commit themselves to you and trust you for your guidance and your wisdom. Lord God, we pray for our world. We look around our world, we see so much hurt and pain, so much loss, so much suffering, so much corruption. Oh God, and we realise many of your people suffer so much persecution and pressure and deprivation because they love you. Lord, we commit them to you and we pray for your blessing upon your people in your church today. We pray for justice in lands where there is no justice. We pray, oh Lord God, for the spiritual darkness of those which hate your name and hate your people. That you, Lord God, will open our eyes, like you did with the Apostle Paul, like you did with King Nebuchadnezzar, 
to realise and acknowledge that you are Lord, that you are God, and that they cannot fight against the Almighty God, but instead they may come and humble themselves before you and trust in you as their Saviour. Lord, these prayers are big. These prayers are impossible for us to do, but there is nothing impossible for our great God. You delight to hear the prayers of your people. You delight to answer the prayers of your people. So please, Lord, hear our prayers now in accordance with your will, for the glory of your great name. So forgive our sins now and accept our praise for Jesus' precious sake alone. Amen. The second hymn we're going to listen to this morning is Who Can Cheer the Heart Like Jesus?
turn please to our Bibles this morning, to our Bible reading, which is 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. And we begin reading at verse 1. Like I said last week, we're here for quite a few Sundays in the morning, the next month or so. And I'm going to start looking at the life of King David. Obviously we're starting with the first bit of David's life this week. And he was anointed king when he was just a shepherd boy. So 1 Samuel 16. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn of oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you should do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said. And he went to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was that when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely this is the Lord's anointed before me. The Lord said to Samuel, don't look at his outward appearance or his physical stature, because I have refused him. The Lord does not see as man sees. A man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And the Lord said, Neither has the Lord and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, are these all the young men? He said, well, there remains yet the youngest, but he's looking after the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send for him and bring him here. For we will not sit down till he has come here. So he was sent and he brought him in. And he was ruddy with good eyes, bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants who are before you. To seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And it shall be that he will play it. With his hand, when the distress and spirit from the Lord God is upon you, and you shall be well. The soul said to his servants, Provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. And one of his servants answered and said, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skilled in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the Lord's with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse, he said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread a skin of wine and a young goat, and sent them by his son David to the king. So David came to Saul, and he stood before him. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became Saul's armour-bearer. Then Saul sent to Jesse and said, Please let David stand before me, for he has found favour in my sight. And so it was, whenever the Spirit from God was upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play it with his hand. And Saul would become refreshed and well, and a stress and spirit would depart from him. I said just now, we're going to carry on looking at the life of David this week. We did an introduction last week, didn't we? We're going to start looking properly at the life of David this week. And Cornelia, a little question to ask you a minute. You turn around a minute so I can see you, okay? Brilliant. Now, this is the question I want to think about this morning. What is the most important thing about you? What is the most important thing about you? In fact, if I asked every one of us individually this, and everyone was really honest, we'd all probably have a different answer. But what is the most important thing about you? What's the most important thing about me and your mum and dad and every one of us here? A lot of us would say, well, it's my looks. Why else do we look in a mirror? We've all got mirrors in our house and we look in them and we check that we look all right, don't we? Yeah? You look in the mirror to see your hair is right, is that right? You look in the mirror to check you haven't got your dinner around your face. Yeah? And we are very concerned about our hair and our looks. Our dress sense perhaps. Perhaps we're very concerned that we always wear branded clothes. 
or branded trainers. Or perhaps it's our personality. We're very concerned what other people see, which is like what we see in the mirror, aren't we? People spend many years and lots of money, Cornelia, trying to look good. And then when they get to a stage in life when they're not quite looking so good as they used to, they then get out the wrinkle cream and the hair dye to try and keep themselves looking good. So what we see in mirrors is what we want other people to see. We make sure it looks right, don't we? The other thing is photographs. Who have we got a photograph of there? Do you know who that is? There's a school uniform, Hayes Down School uniform. It's quite a few many years ago now. Who do you reckon it is? It is Alicia and Ben, that's right. My children in that photograph, okay? Now, when they got sent to school for the school photograph, mum made sure that they had, the hair was right, and they had a clean sweatshirt on. She wanted the picture to look good. We're very concerned about what we're like on the outside. We look in mirrors to check what we're like on the outside. We have photographs where we make sure we smile for the camera so we look our best, don't we? We were very concerned, all of us, about the outside. The outside, to most of us, is a very important thing. It's what other people see, isn't it? In our story today about David, Samuel, the old prophet, was sent to choose a new king. He went to Bethlehem, where David's family lived, and he was going to choose one of David's, one of Jesse's sons. So David had seven older brothers, was eight brothers all together. One of them was going to be the new king. And when Samuel the prophet saw the oldest son, there Samuel turned up seeing Jesse and saying to him, I want one of your sons to be the next king. When he saw the oldest son, Eliab, who was a very tall, big, strong, powerful man, Samuel, he looks very good on the outside. He'll make a great king. But God said to him, no. God says, I don't see the most important thing is what he looks like. I see something else. The verse in the Bible says this. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, don't look at his appearance or his physical stature. He's obviously a big, strong man because I've refused him. The Lord doesn't see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So the most important thing to us is what we look like on the outside. The most important thing to God is what we're like inside. God made you beautiful and pretty and handsome and gorgeous. He made you and gave you the life and the body you've got. But the most important thing to God is not what that body's like on the outside. It's what we're like in our hearts. See, God sees beyond the outside. He sees beyond the things that we see when we look at other people. What God sees that's most important to him is the real you and me. The hair dye and the anti-wrinkle cream and the nice clothes don't hide who we really are from God, does it? God sees past those things. God, see, God sees the real you and me. That means God sees, Cornelia, all the bad things we've done. Bad things we said, the things we think we can hide, we things we think no one else can see, God sees them. And God said to Samuel, like you and me, that's the thing, important thing that in all of our lives that God sees. God sees that thing. And as he looked at Eliab, that oldest boy, he said, he's a very selfish person. He's never going to be a good king. God says, he's not the one I've chosen. In fact, Samuel actually went through all David's older brothers and God didn't choose any of them. But Samuel got confused. He said to Jesse, have you got any other boys? And he said, well, there is the youngest one, David. And Samuel said, send for him and bring him here. So David came in and he was a baby in the family. He was probably only like a teenager at the time, I'd imagine. And David was the one that God said, he's the one I've chosen to be king. So there's Samuel pouring the oil on David's head to sign that David's going to be the next king. God knew that although like us, David had sinned and had done things wrong, and wrong things separate us from God, God knew that David was sorry for those wrong things and that he was trusting God and he loved God. And because of that, God chose David to be the next king. God saw the most important thing in David wasn't what he looked like, wasn't what he was wearing, it was his heart and he knew David loved him and God knew that was the most important thing. So back to our question just now, what's the most important thing about you? To us, it's what we look like perhaps or what we're wearing or where we're going.
to God is what we're like in our heart. It's whether we love him. It's whether we're trusting Jesus, his son, to be our saviour. To take away our sins so that we become part of God's family. That to God is the most important thing. Are we God's children? Are we trusting God like David did? Trust him to be our friend. Trust him to be our saviour. Trust him to take away the bad things and wrong things in our life. And be with us every day. David knew that Jesus, that God was his God and his saviour. Do we? And that's what I want to think about this morning with David. Before we do, we're just going to listen to one more hymn. Him, it tells us about how much God loves us. And how God has made a way that you and I can really be his friends. He has dealt with the most important thing in our life. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Again, please, in our Bibles, to a passage we looked at earlier on in 1 Samuel 16. A little bit of background, first of all, to this story. For many years, Israel had had no king. Ever since they first became a nation, when they came out of Egypt, they had no king. God had always been their king. They had prophets, military leaders like Joshua, prophets like Samuel, people that guided them and given them messages from God, but they had not ever had king. They had judges like Samson and Gideon, but never a king. God had always been their king, but what a king. Imagine, God never fails and never forgets. 
God never changes. God's way is always best. Imagine having a perfect ruler, a perfect leader, a perfect king who loves and cares for you and knows individually every subject in his kingdom. Compare that to the rulers and the leaders we've grown up with. Imagine a leader that could never make a mistake, never forgets, never fails, never needs a rescue plan, never needs to change his mind and never forgets a single one of his subjects. That is the king that Israel had. No lies, no failures, no mistakes. Yet when Samuel the prophet was old, Israel came to him and they said, we want a king like other nations. They were rejecting God as their king. They were rejecting God's rule. This has been happening to mankind ever since Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. When they first rejected what God said and took the fruit from that tree. They questioned and doubted God's way and what their own way, didn't they? It's happened to mankind throughout history. We want our way, not God's way. But God heard Israel and he gave them the king they wanted. He gave them a tall, strong, handsome, inspiring king called Saul. He looked brilliant on the outside. He was everything they dreamed of. He was a Disney superhero type of king. You know, big broad shoulders, big chin. The one that everyone else looks up to. It's head and shoulders taller than everyone else. Bulging muscles. The perfect person to inspire his army. The perfect person to look up to. The hero. On the outside, Saul had it all. But soon, the most important bit about Saul became noticeable. You see, God doesn't look at the outside. God looks at the heart, doesn't he? And Saul was a selfish, paranoid, jealous man. He wanted his way, not God's way. There's a verse in the Bible that says these words, isn't there? There's a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. And let's be realistic, every one of us likes to go our own way. And Saul was no exception. Finally, God tells Samuel, after Saul's con continued failures, that he's rejected Saul as king. And he has to go to Bethlehem and anoint one of Jesse's sons as the next king. Now Saul by now is a very jealous, paranoid king. So Samuel goes secretly to anoint this new king. And as we said before, Samuel is doing when he gets there and he meets Jesse's family and all Jesse's sons, exactly what all of us do. He's looking at the outside. He's concerned about what the next king's going to look like. His physical strength, his physical appearance. But God says, like we said earlier on, he doesn't look on the outside. God looks at the heart. God does not see us the way we see ourselves. God doesn't see us, other people, the way we see them. So all Jesse's sons pass before Samuel and God doesn't choose any of them. So he turns to Jesse and he says, is this all your sons? Well, no, says Jesse. There's the youngest one. He's looking after the sheep, the baby, the family. The job's gone for the family. It started with Eliab. Now it's down to David. Everyone else comes to important functions and social events like this. Everyone else comes to big feasts and sacrifices. But David doesn't matter. He's only the youngster. He's looking after the sheep. Forget about him. David wasn't seen as important enough to be there. How does his family view him? Well, he was, he was the baby. He'd been given all the jobs no one else wanted to do. How does society view him? Too young. Not important. Bottom of the ladder. To brag about being a shepherd wasn't much to brag about. It was the job that no one else wanted. Who wants to be stuck all day out in the fields looking after sheep and go their own way and do their own thing? Risking your life to protect them. It's antisocial. You come home smelling in the evening. It's not really the job that you normally think you'd want. You wouldn't be queuing up to become a shepherd as the job application went out. But as God told Samuel, God doesn't see how we see. Just a little reminder here from the Bible. In Isaiah 55... Verse 8 and 9, we read these words. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts in your thoughts. God's view is bigger than ours. God sees the whole picture. He sees way beyond what we see in our own lives and in other people's lives, even in history. And again, what we just read now in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. Don't look at his outward appearance. The Lord does not see as man sees. A man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 
God sees the real person. There is no hiding who you are, every detail of you, before God. Thirdly, in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27 to 29, we read these words. The Lord has not chosen the foolish, but the Lord has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. The base things of the world, the things which are despised, God has chosen. The things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. God doesn't see importance how we measure importance. In fact, put it this way around. Importance is not important to God. Importance is not important to God. We're all about qualifications, aren't we? Are you qualified to do the job? Have you been to university? Are you an acceptable age? Are you fitting for the job? Do you look good enough to be able to do this job? Are you the sort of person we want to present in our company? And so on. Have you done the training course? Have you done the health and safety course? Have you done this? Have you done that? Have you got letters after your name? Have you got a title? These are the things that we look at. Importance is not important to God. God can take nothing and do great things. God can take a slave trader and use him to change lives. God can take a tailor and make him a great missionary. God can take nobodies. The Apostle Paul was just a tent maker. You look for the Bible time and time again. Gideon. Moses was a shepherd. Gideon was a nobody in his family. And God took these people and used them to do great things. His glory. God, finally, in 2 Corinthians 12, you one more thing about what God says. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 and 10. God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will gladly I will boast in my infirmities. And the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs in persecution and in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God knows the greatest and the greatness comes in trust in him. When I am weak, then I am strong. I'm not relying on my own strength, my own ability and my qualifications and what I know. I'm relying on the God that made me and gave me everything I've got the God that loves me. So God does not see how we see. To God, importance is not important. So what is it that God actually sees in David when this shepherd boy comes in, smelling the fresh air, smelling the fields, probably with sheep wool still stuck on his clothes. His hair is a mess, it's everywhere. Yeah, he's quite good looking, but he's young, he's inexperienced, he's got no qualifications, he's a teenager. His family couldn't see it, so what is it God sees in David? Why is David God's chosen king? And all the people that lived in Israel. To God, age is not important. But our relationship with him is important. Today, our media, society, and to a degree, the church as well, the established church, looks at the outward appearance and looks and qualifications and it makes its choice. That's not the right person for the job. They're not qualified. If you don't look the part, if you don't have the qualifications or you're too young, then you're not good enough. And someone more experienced gets the job before you. When you go for interviews, I remember my daughter saying this when she went for interviews. She had all the qualifications she needed for those interviews, but she said, come away, and they tell me they want experience. They go to someone else because they've got experience. And we look for what we think is the most important person for the job, don't we? But God here, we're told here, looks at the heart. I don't know what stage in his life David wrote Psalm 23. Was he still that little shepherd, teenage shepherd boy, alone with the sheep in the fields? Was he an older man looking back over his life and reminiscing? And comparing being a shepherd to everything that's happened in his life? I don't know. Was he looking ahead when he wrote some of the things in that psalm? Or was he looking back? I'm not sure. But I just want to read Psalm 23 and I want you to notice this psalm is all about every step of the way. David's with God and God's with David. Listen to these words again. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
He makes me lie down. So he's with him in green pastures. He leads me by the still waters. So he's there. He restores my soul. He's there. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He's there. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You're there. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. He's there. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He's with his God. Every step of that psalm through the whole of David's life, whether he's looking back or whether he's looking ahead, he is saying every day, every moment, my God is with me and I am with him. I don't know what stage of life David wrote that psalm, but David's relationship with God was for every day and every situation. You think of those words I often quote from 1 Peter 5 verse 7, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. David knew that. He knew his God loved and cared for him. That was reality. That's how David lived. And that was what God saw when he looked at David. He saw a person that loved and trusted him. Whose heart was right with him. He described other places in the Bible as a man after God's own heart, didn't he? David looked at those sheep he was looking after as needy, willful, helpless, rebellious. He knew what the sheep were like. And he could associate his life with that of a sheep. And puts himself in that cell in the picture of being like one of those sheep. And as he looks at those sheep and he sees how they need him and they cannot survive without him. He knows he needs his God and he can't survive without his God. He sees his God as the one shepherd who could save him, keep him, guide him and protect him. David's life is built on a personal relationship with God every day. David knew God was with him and God was in control. How about us this morning? To David, God wasn't a fire extinguisher he wheeled out when he had a problem. God was like the air he breathed. It was automatic for David to talk to God and trust in God every day of his life. Now you and I need air to breathe, don't we? Without air, we can't exist. It was like God was David's native air he breathed. He needed his God. His God needed him. Now, isn't a sign of weakness? Sometimes he gets a mistake of thinking that we have to pray as a sign of weakness, that we can't cope. It's one of the biggest temptations the devil wheels out. It's all this stuff about being good and trying by your own effort stuff, isn't it? It goes into every other religion in the world. To acknowledge that you need God every breath you breathe is not a sign of weakness. That is a sign of strength. When I am weak, then I am strong. David was not weak because he acknowledged and saw his need of God. Even amongst Christians, there's a mentality where to ask for prayer is a sign of weakness. We don't want to do that. It gives the impression we can't cope. What a load of rubbish. Is God a fire extinguisher to you and me this morning? When we've got a really, really big problem, we go, oh, perhaps I better pray about it. Or is he like the air we breathe? Someone we turn to automatically. Every day. And because it was natural for David to live every day trusting God. When the big problems did come, David automatically turns to his God. It's not mentioned in that chapter, but it is in the following chapter. Where bear and lions both came and tried to steal and kill those sheep. Now, a teenager against a bear and a lion. A grown man against a bear and a lion. It's a pretty impossible situation. The power that a bear has, or a lion has, is far superior to human strength. If that lion or bear wants a sheep, how are you really seriously going to stop it in your own strength? Well, listen to what David says. When he's talking to Saul in the chapter following, which we'll be looking at in a couple of weeks' time. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 34, listen to what David says. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep when a lion or bear came and took a lamb at the flock. I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and I struck it and I killed it. Your servant is killed by a lion and a bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine, referring to Goliath, will be like one of them, seeing as he fight the armies of the living God. David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. 
Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. A teenager against a lion and bear, an impossible situation. But David had no problem with the impossible because he's trusting in the God, the impossible. Why? Because David realised how great his God was. That's why Goliath was nothing more than the next situation that he was going to face of God. Nine and a half foot of bulging muscle and arrogance and anger to David was no worse than lion or bear. Because he knew his God was bigger and greater. And it was as simple for David as that. He wasn't bragging when he stood before Saul. He was just saying how it really is. With a simple, almost childlike faith in his great God. Simply, there was nothing David wouldn't trust God with. There was nothing David wouldn't do for his God. And he knew God was with him. There was nothing David saw as beyond the power and greatness of his God. With his God, David would go anywhere and face anything. He knew his God is almighty and he knew his God can do anything. What made David great was his relationship with his great God. How about you and me this morning? How is our relationship with God? Perhaps this morning, you've relied on your own efforts for many, many years to be respectable and good and do the right thing. Do we realise yet that our efforts could never save us? They cannot deal with our sin. They cannot get us up to God's standard of perfection. Have we stopped trusting ourselves and looked at Calvary and realised what Christ did when he died in our place on that cross is what makes us right with God? And trusted in his forgiveness. And trusted in his salvation. Trusted him completely as our Lord and Saviour. If you never have before. You can spend a lifetime relying on your own effort. But you need to come. And let go of your efforts. And put your trust in the one person. That can save you. And forgive you. Perhaps you might say. Well I've done that many years ago. I trusted Christ many years ago. I've known him my Saviour for many years. Another question is for you then. Are we really living every day trusting him completely like David did? Too often as Christians, and I know I've used the illustration before, we paddle in a relationship with God. There's something about our human nature, we like to have our feet on the ground and think we're in control. We like to stand and think, well it's fine, if a wave comes in in a minute, I'm going to trust my own efforts to keep me upright. I'm going to stand here and I'm going to rely on my own efforts. And we say, yeah, I've got a relationship with God. Like, yeah, that person stood in the sea there and they're paddling. They stood in the sea but are relying on their own efforts, aren't they? And they stay where they feel in their comfort zone. They stay trusting their own efforts. They never go very far. They never achieve a fat lot because if they get too far, they'll be at their depth. And they don't like that. So they stay where they're in control. And they stay where they can rely on their own efforts. We want to be in control. So our prayers are limited to how far we're prepared to go out, aren't they? Our prayers are limited to something that we assume if we can't do it, then God can't do it either. There's a lot of Christians that live their lives like that. <coughs> but where we need to be is there. Swimming in the ocean of God's love and our relationship with him. We need to be at our depth. We're at our depth, we're not in control. We're at our depth, we're not relying on our own ability, are we? That swimmer swimming in the ocean is relying solely on that ocean to keep him up. But he's going places, isn't he? He's going to depths and lengths that you can never do. Paddling. He has his total faith in that ocean to support him. Is that us in our relationship with God this morning? Are we trusting our great God like David did? For everything. Big or small. Every moment. Every day. God chose David finally. Our last point this morning. God chose David. Listen to these words found in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us of every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Just he chose us in him before the foundation of this world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Every child of God 
the person that loves and trusts in God has been chosen by him. Before time began, he knew about every one of us, but he still loved and chose us. Why? Why choose David? Why choose you and me if we are trusting Christ our Saviour? Because let's remember, he sees everything, not just the outside bit that we want people to see. He sees the real you and me. He sees the paddy tantrums, the tempers, the selfishness, the bad thoughts, the arrogance, the pride, the forgetfulness bitchiness, the size of our nature perhaps we want to hide, the mistakes we've made, the things we've said and thought and done that no one else sees. There's nowhere to hide. David knew that. David often openly talked in the Psalms to his God about his struggles and his fears and his problems. He confessed his sins. Why? Because he knew that his God knew. God not only knows, God understands, God cares, God hears. Listen to what David wrote in Psalm 139, verse 1. Lord, you have searched me. You have known my... You know when I sit down, you know when I rise up. You understand my thoughts are far off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with my ways. There's not a word on my tongue, but hold, Lord, you know it altogether. You've hedged me behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's so high, I can't attain it. He says, my God knows everything about me. Everything I've said and done and thought. And every movement I make and everything I do every day. Then he goes on to say this in verse 13 of that psalm. You formed my inner parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are your works and my soul knows really well. My frame is not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought on the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance. You saw me, God, before I was yet born, when I was unformed. And in your book, all the days of my life are written before any of them even began. How precious are your thoughts to me, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they'd be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. David says, even before I was born, my God knew me and he chose me and he loved me. The salvation of a child of God is no surprise. The salvation of a child of God is no mistake. It's no accident. It's all about our great God and his plan for our history. His plan is fulfilled at Calvary by Jesus. David, the teenage shepherd, unimportant in the world's eyes, was going to become one of the biggest links in Christ's family tree. Christ was often referred to as the son of David, wasn't he? Born in the same town. David was a crucial part in God's plan of salvation for you and me. So you, we could say, in a way, that God had our salvation in mind when he chose David two and a half thousand years ago. This is how great our God is. This is how great David's God is. This is how great my God is. My shepherd, my king, my saviour. Everything I am today is because of who he is and because of what he's done. He knows every detail of my life like he did of David's. He wasn't concerned with the outside. He was concerned with the fact that David loved his God. And that God was David's every breath. That David wasn't paddling in the shallows. He was swimming in the depths of a relationship with God. And because of that, David was going to do great things for God. Because David's God is a great God. Our God is a great God. Are we paddling in the shallows? Or are we swimming out of our depth? Trust in him. There's no shame in asking for prayer. There's no shame in talking to God about everything, big or small. Because he's our God. He knows, he understands, he sees. He truly says, cast all your cares on me because I care for you. David had a relationship with God that was real. Do you? You listen to the last hymn. It talks about you and me being where we are today, not because of what we've done, but because of him. It's not about me. It's about him. Yet not I.
Heavenly Father, we truly thank you that you are our great God. You are everything we need. Our salvation is in Christ and in Christ alone. Our future is through the victory and resurrection that he has won for us. Our hope is based in you and in you alone. Lord God, take us out of the shallows. Take us with you in the depths of a relationship. It's for every day, for every moment, big and small. Put our hand in yours and to say, it's not about me, it's about you. And help us to walk like David did with our great God. For Jesus' precious sake alone. Amen.